Whoa, this is the illusion reporting from somewhere on Spaceship Earth. I'm in front of a fat X. The hologram's getting some business cards made. It's going to a convention or something in a couple weeks. Owl's fully sleeping in the back. And um, so I've gotten a bunch of like email requests for people wanting to know the, uh, the illusions transition from Hiroshima, Nagasaki to Hamish, Patterson, and then ultimately the illusion. So when I was out drinking and using, right, like for a long time in my life, it like worked. Like I did my own thing. It's only in retrospect I realized it was a mess. But so I'd done my thing for a long time. And then, I don't know, somewhere in my mid-30s, it really just augured. It really, I crashed my spaceship into the end of the world, man. And I couldn't really f function with the humans. I was at war with the humans. I was, I was at war with seven and a half billion people on a daily level. Alcohol, drugs were my medicine. I could function, but I was definitely a hermit and an isolator. Yeah, you know, I would I would go to work and work with the boys, building houses and doing construction and, you know, hang out. Like, I wasn't totally anti-social hermit, but I was definitely, like, at war with the average person. And so... At some point, like, I was kind of depressed, really, I was super depressed, super dark in this space. So I was like, I didn't like when people came up and talked to me and I would roll around with my head down and a full scowl and the whole thing. And if people came up to talk to me, I would introduce myself as Hiroshima Nagasaki. I'd be, they'd be like, what's your name? I'd be like, Hiroshima Nagasaki. And it was my giant clue to like, leave me alone. And it was just, you know, this thing, if you could figure it out. And many people were like, whoa, you're Hiroshima Nagasaki? All right, later. Because if you made it past that, like there was no telling where it was going. And I really was resentful if people would ask me how it's going. I'd flip out. So anyway, at the at the end there, I was my friends let me stay at this on the top of one of these mountains up the canyon I grew up on, in this house that had burned down in the '93 fires, with the ultimate 360 degree view of Los Angeles and the, the Santa Monica Bay and the Pacific Ocean and the valley. And there was an empty swimming pool there. We used to skate. It was called the Voodoo Bowl. And so I knew the property owner. And so they were like, dude, you can stay up there. We don't care. Just keep the skaters and the troublemakers out of there. So I had my like chain across the, the, the gate down there. And I used to just camp out there. My pickup truck I had dialed. So I would sit up there and drink and do my drugs. And dude, I, some nights were rad. I got to say, some nights were like the best ever. I used to do this thing where I was like crank my music, I had my headphones on and I was literally like a rock star on my stage overlooking the world. And then many nights it was super dark, sorrowful, like what, what happened, man? And at that stage, I was at my late thirties. I was about to be 40. And so I, you know, I would, was like, I missed life, man. Like I'm just all up here on this mountain alone. I've totally missed the boat. I'm doomed. I'm about to get old and die. And at the same time, like I live in the, t where my folks are. And I used to duck my parents. Like I'd see him and go the other way. I was a real donkey, super hard on my folks, I imagine. And so I was living this sketchy lifestyle and you know at the same time I wouldn't drink and drive so I would get my booze and I would go up to the mountain and I would hide out up there and so I would wake up in the morning overlooking LA and every day I would wish for mushroom clouds I was just like I'll oh, just see it dude enough I can't believe I got to do another day down here that's was my mentality I was Hiroshima Nagasaki just wishing for mushroom clouds, 
not wanting to spend another day dealing with the humans. And it would be so hot up on top of the mountain that I'd have to go down to either go to work or just get off the mountain. So anyway, I remember at the time like hard alcohol was too crazy, too quick. Beer was like too much. It was just, you know, I had to drink too much of it. It was it was a it was like work. And so I was drinking these things called sparks, which were like alcoholic energy drinks. I would drink sparks and Mike's hard lemonade and these like pre-made mudslide things, dude, from TGI Fridays. Ugh. So anyway, I was doing my thing up there and I was in the rhythm of it all. And one night, I, I remember that beer went on sale at the CVS in like 24 packs, cost less. than yeah, I would have to like spend all sorts of time figuring out what I was gonna drink, what kind of beer I was gonna drink every night. It was like, just a nightmare. And it was Budweiser was super cheap. I was into, I had a whole Coors thing going for a little while. Coors, dude, the banquet beer. Uh, Paps, all of it, dude. Sierra Nevada torpedoes, dude. The torpedillos used to just get me. Dude, it would sink my battleship for sure, dude. So one night I changed up my recipe and I, I had a bunch of skaters because there was like another skate pool down below the Etnies Bowl. And I would go down there and skate and then like recruit people to come up to the Voodoo Bowl, which was a super challenging, sketchy bowl to skate man it was the raddest and I had this this one night I'd gone down I'd gotten all these dudes and I remember it was like Shano Borland and and Kern Caples and all these like young bucks were ripping and I was like about to run out of beer and I didn't drive after dark so I boogied down the canyon to park because there's like the local liquor store country liquor down there and uh I parked behind the florist, so I didn't have to get on the highway or anything. And uh, I went across the street to the bar. And I was drinking, getting pickled at the bar. They got this restaurant bar and the, the screaming clam, but that's not what it's called, the sea lion. I forget what it's called now. Anyway, I was getting pickled there. Unbeknownst to me, there were two dudes eating in that restaurant, right? So I'm getting pickled there and I'm like, oh my God, I gotta get over to the liquor store before it closes at 10. So I went over there to buy a a, a 12 pack, a pack of smokes, some Slim Jims and a bag of Doritos. And these two dudes come whipping in and park sideways across the lines. And you gotta know, this is like my local little old country mart. This is my old canyon. I've grown, been there since I was like 16. We used to drink in the back of this place. Like it's like where I started, my, where I started drinking kind of. And so these dudes park crooked and, and you gotta understand the parking is super sketchy down there. Like there isn't a lot of it. So it's always a nightmare. So me being like the local donkey deputy dog was like, what are you guys doing dude? not all mellow like that like I'm like what do you think you're doing parking all crooked again don't you see what the lines are on the, the the pavement don't don't you respect the lines don't you respect the lines remember this is Hiroshima Nagasaki talking so there's this dude one guy bolts into the store this other guy leans up against the car and gets his cigarette going and it's this old ex hockey player bald all like bastion hockey player guy big gnarly dude and i'm like i got my bag of beer and slim jims and smokes and doritos and i'm hassling this dude like what the, what the guys aren't from around here obviously you wouldn't be parking crooked blah 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 and i get my smokes out and i'm like I'm like, hey man, you got a light? And he's like, yeah. And I gotta go in to get the light from this guy, right? And I go in to get the light and the miracle occurred. I look in this dude's eyes. I'm hammered. I look in this dude's eyes and I go, you're one of those sober guys, aren't you? And he's like, yeah, what of it, man? And I go, I changed my demeanor right then and there. I go, I need some help, man. I really need help, dude. He's like, all right, all right, here's my card, man. Call me in the morning. I'm like, I'm like, no, man, I need some help for real, dude. I'm like, dude, he's like, just relax. I get started getting all at you. He's like, relax, dude. He's like, 
take my card and just go home, drink your beer and call me in the morning. And I'm like, no, man, I don't need these beers. And I throw them up in the air, right? And the beers come raining down, but I'm also like full, like, Scat paranoid guy, so I scoop up all my beers real quick because it's pretty public where I was on the side of the PCH, and I scoop them back up, and I'm like, "Not cool, man. You guys are supposed to be helping me. I know that, man. If you're sober, guy, you're." And I didn't know what I was talking about, and so I leave to walk away, and I turn around one more time, and I go, "Dude, you're supposed to be helping me," and he's like, "All right, dude." This guy, Joe, used dude more than I do. He's like, all right, dude. He's from Boston. All right, dude, what are you going to do with that bag full of beer? And I take this bag, my bag full of beer, and I take it, and I slam it into this trash can that's sitting right next to me. And I go, I'm done with it. And he's like, all right, get in the car. And right when he is, the other guy's coming out. And what had happened is they had been eating at the restaurant where I was drinking at the bar. And they had gone in to get cream for their coffee and they, they were like, come with me. And you gotta understand, Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the time didn't talk to strangers, only hassled people. So me getting into a car with two strange dudes was like, they could have killed me that night. They could have literally taken a sawzall to me and dismembered me in a bathtub, dude. I was just like, whatever, man. All right, I'll get in the car with you fools. And, uh, so I got in the car with these dudes and it turned out they had just opened a sober living and didn't have any clients. Actually, they did have a client. They had this girl who was the daughter of the keyboardist from Boy George's band. Cadillac Ron's wife, dude. Rest in peace, Cadillac Ron. And uh, so I'm up there at this place right and I talked to these dudes and they're like I talked to them all night and I'm like they're like all right dude you can well you know we'll help you do anything to get sober if you're willing to do anything to get sober and I'm like all right yeah and they're like all right well you stay here now and I go all right but like my car is parked down at the florist and I have to be at work at 7 a.m dude like I can't, I don't know where I am because I didn't know, really know where I was. I was hammered. And I was like, I don't know where I am and I need my car. And they're like, we'll go get it in the morning. I go, no, dude, no, no. I need to be able to go to work in the morning. I'm super that guy. Like, it doesn't matter what's going on. I'm getting to work in the morning. And they're like, dude, just, for, and I go, dude, I'll walk right now and just go get, go back to wherever I go. Like, and they're like, all right, dude. Let's go get your car, man. And so they they drove down and we got my car and they drove it back up to the house. And the next morning I woke up in this crazy old like house from back in the day, dude, this beauty. And I wake up in this like oak lined wooden library, like on this couch. And there's this giant, I'll never forget, there's this giant painting of a sailing ship. And there's a reason why that's significant, but that's a whole nother story. So there's this, this, this sailing ship going through it and it's from this book I wrote. So I know, I symbolically know what I'm looking at. And I get up there, and what did we had talked about that night was like, we'll meet you at the liquor store after work tomorrow. And I'm like, all right, man. All right, I'll see. Cause I got to get up at like six and go to the work, dude, and build, like build. And so, I go to work, I, my car's out front, I, I leave, I go to work, a whole day I'm, I'm fighting a brutal hangover. And I'm like, am I, who, the, who were those dudes? And like, what went on last night, dude? Like, what, what, huh? Sober guys, what? I'm like, am I really gonna meet these guys after work? Am I really gonna meet these dudes after work? And I debated it all work long, man, sweating and just feeling crappy, like debating whether I, who these guys were, whether I'm going to meet him or not. And so I went to the liquor store after work and there was Joe. Joe was the guy. Joe sitting there in his car waiting for me, man. And so I followed them back up to the house. And dude, there was like a couple dudes there that had been there that night and they were like cheering when I came, came walking back in the door, dude. They're like, you made it back. You made it back right on, right on. You made it back. And that began my journey in, in sobriety, man. And, uh, 
there's probably a whole nother video that's the journey, but that's the, uh, the 24 hours that changed my life. And it was a moment of clarity. It was the moment I looked in that dude's eyes. I don't know. I, the, because this dude, Joe, was so connected to God that like literally like God shot laser beams out of his eyes. And, and I saw. I was, I was wasted enough to see it. See, people don't understand. It's like the real moment of clarity you have is sort of in this alcoholic psychosis, dude. Like, it's a gift, man. And so, cause that's the joke, dude. You, like at a certain point I would get so wasted, I would be sober. Like, I don't know if the, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what it's like when you're tripping and you're, you're so high on LSD or mushrooms that like you're totally stone cold, like sober, like you're in the zone. So uh, that was, that was <sighs> almost nine years ago. And there's just a whole nother story. There's almost a part. Two. There's definitely a part two to this. But that's that's the uh, me meeting Joe and Dave. And this other dude, David, man. They, David and Joe were the two dudes in the car, man. They saved my life, dude. Like, they really did, man. Joe died recently. And, and David's still alive, man. I talk to David every now and then. Dude, he's a rad dude. I'm super blessed to have those dudes took me in, man took me in and helped me get sober in spite of my own Hiroshima Nagasaki. It's kind of heavy. I'm going to do a part two, dude, about this whole thing, but I don't think I have enough storage in my phone to do it tonight. 